Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk about the sanctions. This war has been going on since the 24th of February. And over that period, we have seen a variety of financial sanctions applied against Russia. And these sanctions are being layered on top of one another. So the cumulative impact is getting worse and worse for Russia on a daily basis. So in today's episode, we'll have a recap of the major sanctions that have been applied against Russia. We'll have a look specifically at what's been going on with regards to gas and oil and technology, because they are three key areas for Russia's economy. We'll then talk about secondary sanctions, because they will be critical over the longer term, particularly when we're talking about Russia's trade with India and China. And then I'll show you some charts and they will show you the specific impact on Russia's economy of all of the sanctions. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next three to six months for Russia and Russia's economy, and what the impact of all of this is for the global economy. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Don't forget, I always include chapters, so if you don't have time to watch the whole video, you can pick and choose what you'd like to see. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube super thanks and membership, as well as buy me a coffee, Patreon and Amazon shopping links. And once again, I'd just like to say thank you so much to everybody that has supported the channel. I really appreciate it. Now, Russia's invasion of Ukraine started on the 24th of February 2022. However, this wasn't the first time that Russia has actually invaded a Ukrainian territory. Back in 2014, Russia sent its tanks and troops into Crimea. And after a period of occupation, it held referendums. Those referendums officially voted in favour of joining Russia and Russia annexed that area. Now, during that period, a number of financial sanctions were applied against Russia. But unlike the current situation, no real military or financial support was provided to Ukraine to fight back against the Russian offensive. So the situation was very similar to what's happening right now, but it was a very watered down version. But at that time, the West did introduce a variety of sanctions against Russia, but they were relatively limited and didn't really have a major impact on Russia's economy. Now, the reason that I wanted to mention that is that the West had already been through this process once. So it would already been considering what financial sanctions and what other sanctions could be applied against Russia. So almost immediately after the invasion started on the 24th of February, a variety of sanctions were introduced overnight. Now, the first round of those sanctions were financial sanctions. So Russia was banned from the SWIFT payment system, which was the international system that is used all across the world for transferring money between companies and governments. So that caused them problems in terms of actually making payments and receiving payments. And in addition to that, a variety of financial institutions were also sanctions. So that meant that certain banks couldn't actually operate in the financial markets in addition to SWIFT. So this actually sanctioned those institutions and a variety of military companies and key oligarchs. So the very wealthy Russian billionaires were all targeted in that first round of sanctions. Now, subsequent to that first round, we have seen another seven rounds of sanctions. So there have been eight sets of sanctions that have been formally issued by a variety of countries all around the world. So the countries that have been leading the charge in these sanctions are the USA, Canada, the UK, the European Union, which consists of 27 countries. And then we've got countries like Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand and a variety of others. So where we are right now is that it is very difficult for any company or individual in Russia to be able to do business with the West and with the secondary sanctions, it's now becoming much more difficult for those companies to continue their trading relationships with other countries who are not party to the sanctions directly, but do have trading relationships with the West. And they are now running the risk of losing those relationships if they continue dealing with Russia. So that gives you a general overview of the sanctions. But I want to go into more detail for the key areas that will affect Russia's economy. So let's have a look at what's happening with regards to natural gas. Before we go on any further, I wanted to talk about today's sponsor, Atlas VPN, and to tell you about their amazing Black Friday deal. If you use the internet without any form of protection, you leave yourself exposed to tracking, hacking and advertising. 
Using Atlas VPN protects you from all of these. Atlas VPN provides you with comprehensive security and is used by over 6 million people worldwide. So it's great news that you can stop tracking and hacking and data breaches, but Atlas VPN can also save you money and give you more opportunities in terms of entertainment because it allows you to change your location, which gives you the opportunity to get better deals and to access content that may not be available in your region. Atlas VPN is available to use on unlimited devices for one subscription and is currently offering a fantastic Black Friday deal where you get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.70 per month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Now, this is the best deal that Atlas VPN have offered this year. To steal this exclusive Joe Blogs Black Friday deal, click on the description in the link below. Russia has the largest reserves of natural gas of any country in the world. And because of its physical location close to Europe, it's been the biggest supplier to Europe over the last 20 years. And because natural gas has benefits compared to coal, a lot of countries in Europe decided to build natural gas power stations to create electricity using that source. And in order to set up a low cost, efficient way of delivering this gas, Russia built a variety of pipelines all across Europe that took the gas directly out of the ground and fed it straight to all of the areas that people wanted it in all of the European countries. So this was a fantastic arrangement and worked really well for the last 20 years or so. But the problem that we had as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine was that the whole of the European Union came out and stated that they no longer wanted to buy this gas. Now, in retaliation to those statements, and also in an effort to try to promote the ruble as a genuine competitor to the dollar in global deals, President Putin came out and stated that all of the countries of Europe had to make their future payments in rubles for gas. Now, a number of countries, including Poland, Bulgaria, Denmark, Finland and the Netherlands, all came out and stated that they were not prepared to make payments in rubles and their supplies were cut off overnight. So President Putin was playing hardball. He wanted to show that if you mess with Russia, you will lose. You will get your supplies switched off. So that sent a very strong message to the bigger economies of Europe who needed that gas that they needed to toe the line. So what we saw was Germany and Italy and Austria and a variety of other countries all agreeing to make those payments in rubles. But that didn't mean that they were happy about it or that they wanted to keep the arrangement going in the long term. So we saw Germany and Italy and other countries starting to put LNG facilities in place. They were starting to buy gas from other suppliers. So the USA and Qatar and Norway all started to export more gas to the European Union. And that's the situation that we've got right now. So going forward, the European Union will switch off all of its purchases of gas. And this is really big business for Russia. Over the last 20 years, Russia has got very complacent with the arrangements. So it hasn't been building massive LNG facilities. So it doesn't have the capacity to be able to switch away from all of those pipeline gas supplies into LNG. In 2021, Russia earned over $43 billion from the sale of natural gas. And the vast majority of that was sold into European countries. Over the next three to six months, the vast majority of those revenues are going to disappear for Russia because none of the countries of Europe want to continue with this arrangement. A few of them are having to continue right now because it takes time to put the infrastructure in place and be able to get to a position where they don't need that Russian gas. But as soon as every country gets to that point, Russia will have zero revenue from Europe. And that's going to cause major problems for Russia because it's been relying on this constant and steady source of revenue for the last 15 to 20 years. And it's now going to disappear. And at the same time as that's happening, it's lost its business partners with regards to developing the LNG facilities. So it'd been previously doing that with companies like Shell and BP, and it now doesn't have access to either that expertise or the capital to be able to build those new facilities. So Russia's position in terms of gas supplies globally is going to plummet like a stone. So the impact of the sanctions is going to be very severe and could potentially damage the whole of the gas industry in Russia. Now, oil is the single biggest export for Russia. In 2021, it earned more than $100 billion from the sale of oil. And in 2021, more than half of all of Russia's oil exports went directly into Europe. Now, the immediate impact of Russia's invasion 
was that a number of countries, including the USA and the UK, came out and stated that they would no longer buy any Russian oil. But the actual amount of imports that both of those countries were taking from Russia was relatively small. The situation for the European Union has been a bit more complicated because a lot of the countries were highly dependent on that Russian oil. And in fact, some of them actually take delivery through pipelines that were also constructed to deliver directly to the areas that needed it. So as a result of this dependency and the problems with replacing those Russian supplies, the European Union didn't actually sanction oil purchases. And as it stands right now, European countries are still permitted to buy oil directly from Russia. However, the situation is exactly the same as it is for gas. All of the countries have stated that they no longer want to buy any Russian oil. They don't want to be handing over billions of dollars of revenue to Russia on a regular basis. So they're all busily working on changing their supply chains and trying to buy oil from other suppliers. And the European Union has announced that from December the 5th, it will ban the import of all seaborne oil directly from Russia. So the pipeline supplies will still be permitted until February, but from December the 5th, all shipping will be banned from Russia. And those bans will have a massive impact on the Russian economy. At the start of 2022, Russia was exporting 2.6 million barrels of oil to Europe every single day. And if we take a rough price of around $100 per barrel, that equates to around $260 million per day. Now, the total amount of exports have reduced, but as at the end of August, which is the last month that we have figures for, the exports were still sitting at around 1.7 million barrels per day. So still $170 million of revenue for Russia every single day. Now, come the 5th of December, the vast majority of those exports will stop overnight. So Russia now needs to find alternative markets really quickly in order to keep those revenues coming in. But also, as I've mentioned a number of times on the channel before, it needs to keep its production going. Because as a producer of oil, once once you set up those facilities, you want to keep the flow going as much as possible. You don't want to have to restrict the flow or stop it because that will cause you major problems in the future. And that's doubled down at the moment because Russia has lost its partners because companies like BP Shell and ExxonMobil have all left Russia and it's also losing access to technology. So the last thing that Russia wants to do right now is restrict the amount of flow that's coming out of the ground. So it's facing some major problems. And over the course of the next three to six months, all of these EU sanctions will be fully in place. So no countries in Europe will be buying any more oil from Russia. And that's going to leave a massive black hole in the Russian economy. Now, one of the biggest implications for Russia with regards to the sanctions is the imposition of technology sanctions. So what we've seen over the course of the last seven months or so is a variety of sanctions have been applied, which prevents Russia from buying microchips and software and other essential forms of technology that are being created in the West. Technology is something that's difficult to recreate. You need experts who've been working on certain areas over a long period of time. They build up their knowledge, they build up their designs, and they build up their product base. And that's why we have specialist hubs all around the world in places like Silicon Valley and Taiwan and South Korea and Oxford in the UK. And once these hubs develop their technology, they will then own and license that technology. So in order to be able to use it, you need to have an arrangement with those companies. Now, the technology sanctions that have been put in place have been specifically designed to hurt Russia in a variety of different sectors. So military is an obvious example, but also oil and gas, which is the biggest part of the Russian economy. Because Russia is spread out over a huge land base, and a lot of that land is in northern areas which have extreme climates, so it's very cold, a lot of ice, a lot of permafrost. You need really good technology, firstly, to be able to set up the drilling facilities, and then secondly, to be able to maintain and carry on all of the production. Now, over the course of the last seven months, Russia's lost its trading partners from the West, so it doesn't have access to the expertise. But more importantly, it's lost access to the technology. So the technology that's currently in place, it will continue to run. But as soon as it hits problems, if it has an issue with production 
or drilling or whatever it might be in these inhospitable areas, it won't be able to get replacement parts for all of that tech. And if the software suddenly goes down or it needs to be updated or it just goes into failure mode, then it's going to cause massive issues. And this is something that Russia have been aware of for a long period of time. Back in 2014, when they invaded Crimea, a variety of technology sanctions were applied against Russia. So they've been struggling to get really high-end chips for certain things, particularly in the military side of things. And over the last eight years or so, President Putin has set up an industry trying to develop Russian-owned technology. And that has failed because they are still importing the vast majority of their microchips and the vast majority of their technology. So they're not self-sufficient. Russia is not big enough. It doesn't have enough people. It doesn't have enough technical expertise to be able to develop world-class technology. And the fact that these technology sanctions are in place is really going to hurt the Russian economy over the course of the next few years. The central bank and a number of other senior Russian officials have come out and said that it's likely that Russia will go backwards in terms of its technology over the course of the next five years. So it's having to downgrade, dumb down a lot of what it's doing. And of course, that's not what you want to be if you're trying to be a cutting edge country. If you want to be a front runner in the global economy, you need to be developing your technology in competition with everybody else. You can't sit back and let the rest of the world leave you behind because that will be detrimental to your economy. And that's exactly the situation that Russia's in right now. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, in addition to the direct sanctions, the secondary sanctions are also a major risk to Russia's economy. And secondary sanctions are basically sanctions that are applied against any country or company that continues to deal with Russia if the rest of the world tells them not to do that. So there is a limited benefit to the West setting up a variety of sanctions that are designed to cause problems for Russia to encourage them to stop the war in Ukraine. That's entirely why these sanctions have been put in place, to stop the war. The West is trying to strangle the revenues that Russia is receiving so that at some point Russia says, enough's enough, we don't want to carry on anymore, let's agree a peace settlement. That's what everybody wants to happen. But if Russia is simply able to divert all of its sales of gas and oil from the West to India and China and carry on as normal, then obviously the sanctions were a complete waste of time. So in order to prevent that happening, the West is now talking to countries like India and China to tell them that if they do increase the amount of trade that they're doing with Russia, then they potentially then run the risk of losing all of their trade with the West. Now, India and China export a lot of products to the Western economies. The Western economies are some of the biggest in the world. If you look at the G20 economies, the vast majority of them are in North America and Europe. So this is a big part of the global export markets for India and China. So the threat of losing that business is very real for both of those countries. And we're now starting to see the impact of these secondary sanctions feeding through. So recently we've seen Indian banks deciding that they don't want to do business with Russia in rubles because it runs the risk of secondary sanctions. And we saw Turkish banks and Egyptian banks deciding that they no longer wanted to operate the MER payment system, which was set up by Russia so that Russians who are traveling abroad can use their cards because those banks were concerned that they would be hit by secondary sanctions. Now, Turkey has been neutral through this whole conflict. They've taken a middle ground. They've actually stated that they want to increase the amount of trade that they're doing with Russia. But despite that, the Turkish banks have stated that they don't want to run the risk of secondary sanctions and therefore they've walked away from that payment system. So this shows you how real the risk of secondary sanctions is. And as we go forward, as the ban comes in on oil from the EU on December the 5th, and as we see the EU pulling back from all of those gas purchases, it's likely that the secondary sanctions will be ramped up because at that point the EU can actually say well we're no longer buying any of these products so we don't want you to and that's when we will see maximum pain applied against Russia. So over the course of the next three to six months the secondary sanctions will become more and more important and we will see Russia losing even more revenue. So in terms of the impact of the sanctions so far, I wanted to share with you some data which shows what's been happening to Russia's imports and exports over the course of the last six months or so. This chart shows the value of Russian exports dating back to February 2019 and runs through to the quarter ending June 2022, which is the last set of data that's been released. 
Now the three lines depicted on this graph show the total amount of exports in blue, mineral fuels in red, and goods other than mineral fuels in orange. Now if we look at the total amount of exports first, you can see that in March 2022, Russia exported $46 billion worth of goods. However, by May, we saw a reduction of $6 billion to $40 billion. And in June, exports stayed at that lower level. Now, if we look at the breakdown of those figures and deal with goods other than mineral fuels first, so the orange line, we can see that in January, the total value of goods exported by Russia was $17 billion. However, there has been a consistent month-on-month -month decline, and in June, that figure had dropped to $13 billion. And that represents a fall of over $4 billion. If we then look at mineral fuels, in March, the total amount of exports was $30 billion. That figure dropped to $26 billion in May, and then increased to $27 billion in June. But as I discussed earlier in the video, the European Union is actually still buying oil directly from Russia. There is no official sanction in place because it's taking time for all of those countries to be able to find alternative suppliers. So if we look at the difference between the two charts, we can see that goods other than oil are actually on a steady decline. Oil has fallen, but isn't continuing to fall at the moment. But as soon as we get to the point where Europe does implement those sanctions, we will see a dramatic decline in revenues for Russia. And this chart will give you a better understanding as to the current situation with regards to oil, gas and coal exports to the EU, US and UK. So these are all countries that have applied sanctions directly against Russia. However, they don't apply to any of these fuel products at the moment because there's a transition period going on while everybody's trying to find alternative suppliers. So we can see that in February, March, Russia exported around $11 billion worth of oil directly to the EU. That figure did fall to around $8 billion in May, but rose back up to around $10 billion in June. Now, in terms of gas exports, the EU paid around $5 billion to Russia in March, and that figure has reduced to $3.6 billion in June. In terms of coal exports, the total value is much lower, but has remained stable at around $1 billion. So the reason that I wanted to highlight this is that when the sanctions do kick in, it is likely that all of these revenues will disappear entirely for Russia. And if you look at the situation in June, Russia received $15 billion for all three of these different products directly from the EU. So it's going to lose $15 billion per month. And it's going to be very difficult to replace that because it doesn't have the capacity to turn its gas into LNG. It's struggling to be able to find enough ways of shipping the oil to India and China. And a lot of the coal supplies that are sent to Europe are sent directly by rail. Now, I wanted to share this graphic with you, which shows the destination of all of Russia's oil exports dating back to February 2019. And the different colored sections here represent different economic areas. So the blue section at the bottom is the European Union. The section above that in red is China. In orange, we've got the USA. In green, South Korea. In pink, Japan. In purple, India. In blue, the UK. And in green, Turkey. And the overriding takeaway from this chart is that the vast majority of all of Russia's oil exports are going directly to the EU. If you look at the blue section in June, it is by far the biggest. It is more than 50%. It's significantly more than 50%. And it is going to be a massive challenge for Russia to be able to replace all of that lost revenue with sales to other countries. You can see that sales to China have been increasing over the last few months, but they haven't been increasing nearly enough to offset the massive loss of all of the sales to the EU. And if we look at India towards the top of this chart, you can see that since the start of 2022, there has been a dramatic increase. Prior to 2022, Russia virtually didn't feature in terms of this graph. And it has now started to make its presence known. But if you compare the size of the sales for India and China combined versus what we're seeing for the EU, Russia is going to have to increase its amount of exports exponentially to even break even on the arrangement. And of course, as I've mentioned in other videos, there are some major logistical challenges facing Russia to be able to do that. Firstly, they don't have enough ships to be able to load up all of that oil and send it to India. Secondly, they're having to sell at a discount to these two countries. So every sale that they're replacing from the EU with Chinese and Indian sales 
is at a discount. So they need to actually sell more volume to offset the lost revenue. And thirdly, they've got all of the sanctions that are coming towards them as soon as the EU stops all of its purchases of oil. So some of those will be direct sanctions from the shipping companies and others will be the secondary sanctions that we talked about earlier in the video where China and India will be told not to keep buying things. And then on top of that, we've also got this oil price cap that the G7 is currently working on, whereby Russia will be told that it can't sell its oil above a certain price. And that price at the moment that's being talked around is about $63 per barrel, which is significantly below the current market rates. So the reason I wanted to show you this graph is it really just gives you a good visual representation of the challenge facing Russia it is going to be extremely difficult to replace all of these lost sales to the EU with countries from around the world. And you can see from the colored graph here just how big the problem is that Russia's facing. And this graph shows Russia's other exports, excluding oil. And the situation is exactly the same. So if you look at the section in blue at the bottom, you can see that the EU is still the biggest single export market for Russia, despite the fact that we've now got sanctions in place. Now, these sales will be diminishing further and further over the course of the next three to six months. And Russia needs to find replacement markets. And the problem that it has is that there simply aren't enough replacement markets for all of its exports. Because the EU and the US represent some of the biggest economies in the world. And so in order to replace those, Russia will need to find lots of small economies. And that becomes complicated and logistically challenging. So this again is a good visual representation of the massive challenge facing Russia over the course of the next 3, 6, 12, 24 months because it's losing all of its export markets and it simply won't be able to replace them. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I think the impact of the sanctions is a really important part of what's happening from an economic perspective as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And quite often I get a lot of comments in the section saying Russia is entirely unaffected. They're carrying on as normal. The sanctions are actually hurting the West. Russia isn't seeing any impact. But I think what we've been through today proves that Russia is seeing a massive impact. And particularly over the next three to six months, as we see the European Union starting to enforce those sanctions on oil and gas, that's going to be the time that we see the maximum impact hitting home for Russia because it's still exporting the majority of its oil and gas directly to the EU because those sanctions haven't been firmed yet. They're not fully baked. We've got other sanctions that are in place against financial institutions, individuals, military, technology companies. But we won't really see the full impact until all of the oil and gas purchases stop. And that is now planned to happen. So Russia is bracing itself for this enormous loss of revenue. The EU represents more than 50% of all of Russia's export markets. And it's simply impossible for Russia to be able to replace that with other countries. There are logistical challenges, there are secondary sanctions, and there are just simply too many issues to be able to bypass. So Russia is facing a massive reduction in revenue and it will be going into a major recession. One of the reasons that Russia has stopped publishing all of its data is that it doesn't want the West to be able to see what's actually going on in the economy. And my guess is that the reason that it doesn't want anybody to see those figures is because they are significantly worse than everybody's original forecasts. And what we've looked at today is really just a snapshot of what was happening at the end of June. The situation for Russia is getting worse on a monthly basis. And as we roll forward over the next three, six, 12, 24 months, it's going to get even worse. Until we get an end to the war, these sanctions will be applied heavily against Russia. And it's likely that the secondary sanctions will start to kick in in early 2023. So India and China will be put under a lot of pressure to stop doing business with Russia. And the oil price cap is the first proposal that's been put forward that enables India and China to continue dealing with Russia but applies that sanction against Russian revenues because they will only be allowed to earn a certain amount for the sale of each barrel of oil. So that's going to hurt the Russian economy. And going forward, we could see a collapse of the Russian economy because it's entirely based on revenue from oil and gas sales. Now, the gas side of things is a major problem for Russia because they've grown used to sending all of that gas down the pipelines. Those pipelines will very quickly become redundant. They will be obsolete soon. So they won't be able to 
continue using that source and they haven't been building liquefied natural gas plants. So they're going to drop down the league tables in terms of gas exports. And a similar scenario will apply to oil. If the oil price cap is applied, then obviously that's a direct constraint on Russia's revenues. But even if the oil price cap doesn't happen, there are still logistical challenges in terms of being able to locate enough ships to get the insurance and all of the logistics in place to be able to move all that oil from Russia to India. That is going to cost a lot more money. It's going to reduce Russia's revenues. So overall, the situation is dire. And the reason I wanted to make this video is to remind you of the comprehensive suite of sanctions that are in place and the impact that we're already seeing on Russia. But this isn't a short-term impact. This is going to be a long-term problem for the Russian economy. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video, found it useful, informative and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.